When two children suddenly go missing in a small countryside town where everyone knows everyone, who could have possibly taken them? Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman left a family barbecue and were never seen again. But when somebody starts enjoying the limelight a little too much, this starts to raise the suspicions of the town and police. A case that devastated the nation and the world. Keep listening to see who is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Hi everyone and welcome back to Partners in Crime. My name is Poppy. And I'm Roger. And welcome to our 10th episode. Milestones. Number 10, we're finally here. I'm not very well today. I've got a bit of a sore throat, which isn't ideal when you need to be talking for the next like two hours. So I've got my lemony honey tea. That you're not going to spill all over the laptop? Well, if it happens, it happens, guys. Um. (laughs) There's nothing I can do about it. I'm hoping we're getting this out and it's Halloween. So happy Halloween. Yes, happy Halloween. Happy spooky day. (laughs) But just so everyone knows, I'm not feeling very well. So if my voice sounds a bit funny or maybe I don't sound as... Not enthusiastic, but... Uh, Yeah, that's why. It's because my throat hurts. So, shall we begin? Let's begin. So, this is a case that I remember happening when I was a child. I think we would have been around 10 years old. Okay. When this happened in the UK. Yeah. But obviously being 10, I didn't really understand what was happening. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I just remember seeing pictures on the news, but obviously 10-year-old brain, no idea what's going on. So... Obviously, never learned the outcome back then, um, but years later, I researched the case and found it very shocking. So I thought I'd bring it to the table. I also think this is a case that you will know for okay. the first time. Cool. But you probably won't know all the details. No, no, most likely not. But, but you'll know like the names. The names. Okay. For sure. And if you don't, then where have you been? Mm-hmm. Under a rock. Literally. Today we are in Soham. A small countryside town in Cambridgeshire, England. It is considered to be a safe town to bring children up in with a low crime rate. A very tight-knit community who know each other very well until this happened. All these things always happen locally. It's not far from us, no. no. It's not far. On Sunday the 4th of August 2002... On an extremely hot summer day, around 5pm, 10-year-old Jessica Chapman was at a barbecue at her friend Holly Wells' house. Okay. Recognise the names? I think so. Okay. They were both in the same class together at St Andrews Primary School and were best friends. Holly had a David Beckham Manchester United football shirt on and Jessica wanted to wear one too. So they asked Holly's brother if Jessica could borrow his David Beckham shirt and he said she could. And that is where the famous photo of them comes from. Okay. Taken around 5.04pm. And they look so sweet in the photo. Let me show you it because, I mean, you'll know instantly. I think I know already what this, who this is about. Yeah. I think. That's the image that I remember vividly. Yeah, it does ring a bell. But I, d- I would, can't say actually that, that I remember seeing that. It rings a bell. And then after that, they, uh, instead of kind of like joining with the adults at the barbecue, they then went on the family computer between 5.11 and 5.35 p.m. Okay. Later on that evening, around 8.30 p.m., everyone was leaving the barbecue. Mm-hmm. So Jessica's mum, Sharon, went upstairs to get the girls to say goodbye. But when Sharon got to Jessica's room, the girls were missing. Sharon immediately called the police. 
and police started interviewing the parents, trying to get as much information about the girls from them, up to date photos of the girls that they could give to the media to distribute. So quick action. They were going door to door asking all the neighbours if they had seen or heard anything. It was very unusual for the girls to be out this late without somebody seeing them. They were both born in Soham, so they knew the town inside out and a lot of people knew of them as well. So that's what made this so unusual that nobody had seen them. Mm. Everyone in the neighbourhood came out to help and search. Around 11pm, the local caretaker of Soham College showed the police and um, sniffer dogs around the grounds to see if they were anywhere. He was showing them everywhere he could, but as they got to the storage hangar, he said he couldn't, no, that he didn't have access to this space. But the dogs didn't detect anything there, so they just moved on. Unfortunately, nothing was found around Hmm. the grounds. It had been nearly 12 hours since they were last seen. For two young children to be outside on their own overnight isn't good. Because of the lack of evidence and sightings, police began to get desperate as every second counted in order to get the girls back. Both parents came together to hold a press conference in the hope it will jog somebody's memory. The girls are described as very responsible and have never done anything like this before. The police officer reveals that they had actually been last seen walking around Soham somewhere, but lost sight of them after that. Who said that, sorry? A police officer. Oh, right. Like, they'd been um, in their uh, door-to-door mm. knocking. Someone said, like, oh, yeah, I saw him on this road or whatever. Okay, right, right, right. But so someone it, gave it was kind of like just vague, like there was, you sure. know... Okay. 2002, CCTV isn't, you know, no. everywhere, is it? Um, and in this press conference, you can just see how distraught the parents are, but des- desperately trying to keep it together in order to convey what they need to say. Well, they are going through the absolute worst nightmare. But the question remains, why did the girls leave the house and where have they gone? Hundreds and hundreds of people were ready to help find the girls in any way possible. It was all over the news nationwide. On the 5th of August, Martin Underhill was the Detective Chief Inspector of Sussex Police. Sussex is a county next to where Soham is in Cambridgeshire. He asked that Detective Superintendent David Hankins of Cambridgeshire Police if they wanted assistance in solving the case. And luckily, they said yes, which is great. More manpower, resources and knowledge of these kinds of cases. And of course, as the days went by, more and more media showed up in the small town of Soham. Hundreds of journalists and cameras were swarming the town, trying to get any information they could. It was almost unprecedented how much media support this case was getting. As it wasn't just UK news, it was worldwide. This rarely ever really happens. I imagine... It was kind of on the same scale as like Madeleine McCann. Right. That kind yeah. of level where it was just uh, yeah. what everyone was talking about. Yeah. On the 6th of August, Manchester United England football player and Holly and Jessica's favourite footballer, David Beckham, hmm? held a press conference to appeal for the girls to come home. In his statement, he said, Please go home. You are not in any kind of trouble. Your parents love you deeply and want you back. Which was sweet of him to do, but unfortunately. Hmm. They still didn't come home. No. It is clear police are thinking that the girls think they must be in some kind of trouble for leaving the house without saying anything and are maybe too scared to come home. Yeah. It happens. It, yeah. It, yeah, it does. Maybe not overnight though, but it happens. In another press conference, Holly Wells' parents, Kevin and Nicola, explained their pain when they were informed that family and friends who were searching had been told to start looking in ditches, rivers, and to look for shallow graves. The heartbreak in Kevin's voice when he's explaining this is just horrific and unimaginable. Mm, absolutely. It must so be sad. a very dark moment when you, when your mind turns to, instead of being just missing, they might be dead. Is That's quite mm, horrific. So sad. As well as searching, police were also being bombarded with multiple sightings of the girls. They received around 2,000 calls. And of course, officers had to investigate every single one of these. A £1 million reward was offered to whoever helped find the girls, which is obviously a great thing. 
but unfortunately it means fake sightings get called in too in the hopes that they might get the reward money. I mean, a million pounds in 2002 is... Pretty crazy. Crazy money. money, yeah. One of the first sightings that piqued the investigators' interest was the mention of a car. Around 7pm on the night that Holly and Jessica disappeared, a taxi driver, Ian Webster, was heading south along the A142 towards Newmarket. Apparently, he sees the driver in front struggling with two children and swerving across the road. The metallic green saloon car was speeding and being driven erratically, with a child in the front seat and another girl with light brown hair, similar to Jessica's, in the back. The driver was white, of Mediterranean appearance, or suntanned, aged between 38 and 45, and has black, wiry hair. I'm not sure exactly how he saw all of this information. Mm. It's quite specific. Fairly, yeah. Um, but police, of course, start looking into this sighting yeah. as they had um, started suspecting the girls could have been abducted. Right, sure. On the 7th of August, Detective David Hankins said, quote, I'm a realist. I know most 10-year-old children would have been seen, would have made contact with an adult, would have phoned home. They would have done something to bring attention to the fact that they are away from home. We've had nothing from these two very responsible young girls. My gut feeling is that they have possibly come to some harm. And that evening, friends and family held a vigil at St Andrew's Church in Soham for the girls. It has now been almost a week since Holly and Jessica went missing. Investigators changed tactics to looking for evidence of an abduction. They had around 450 officers at this point searching for the girls. On Thursday the 8th of August, police released footage from a CCTV camera on the Soham Sports Centre. This is only about 400 metres away from Holly's house in Red House Gardens. The quality and everything is absolute crap, but you can just about make out two children wearing possibly red. But what was most important was you could see the direction that they were heading at that time. Therefore, the police could see if there was any more CCTV in that direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were seen entering the sports centre, which um, was described as a hangout spot for kids because of the vending machines inside. But that was it. They couldn't figure out where they went after that. So investigators started asking around that immediate area, knocking on doors, etc., One of the doors they knocked on was the school caretaker that had tried helping the police earlier in the investigation. He told investigators that he saw the girls and they walked off towards Soham Library, which was a further five-minute walk from the sports centre. The police insist they believe the girls are still alive and well and are being held captive. I'm not sure exactly what gave them this idea, but that's what they said. It's a bit weird that they suspected that and they were captive, but I guess if there's the possible sightings of the driver with the, that as well, then I, I don't know, I suppose might give you hope at least anyway. Yeah, I suppose because they haven't got a lot to go on. Right. They're obviously keeping their options open. And yeah, the sighting of the car, they're still figuring out whether that's true or false. You know... There's no evidence of anything else more no. sinister either. So it's just kind of like, right. well, maybe they got abducted then. Yeah. Because you've got to think it's two girls. Like it's it's not just one on their own. No. Two's quite rare. Yeah. I mean, that would be a much more complicated thing to do, you would think as well. For, Absolutely. A, for a, the perpetrator. And they're 10. They're not like feeble. No. Little. No. Kids. No. They're obviously still children, but. You know, they could fight well, a bit. Maybe, a tiny a, bit. But. A tiny bit. Brian Farmer, a journalist, went to interview the caretaker after he heard that he had seen the girls on the day they disappeared. Brian wanted to get exclusive information for his story. When Brian got to the house, he knocked on the door and it was answered by a woman. Her name was Maxine Carr. She sheepishly opened it and spoke to Brian a little with the door ajar. A head popped up behind Maxine and it was the caretaker from the college who Brian had originally come to talk to. And his name was Ian Huntley. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. that confirms everything that I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the caretaker, Ian Huntley. He is the caretaker of the local college. Right. So he's the one that showed the police around earlier. Mm-hmm. And yeah. said that they couldn't get into wherever it was. The storage hangar, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Dubious. Well, not yet, because nobody knows what's going on. Brian described the situation as, quote, I persuaded them after a few minutes to let me in so they could have a chat. I was slightly surprised because Ian Huntley didn't seem keen to talk, which slightly surprised me because normally if children are missing, people will help. It did slightly surprise me, but I didn't think anything particularly dramatic. End quote. Once inside, Brian got talking to Maxine and realised that she was in fact a classroom assistant at the same school as Holly and Jessica and had been part of their class, but her contract had ended with the school a couple of weeks earlier and she was no longer teaching there. She even showed Brian a card that Holly and Jessica had made her when she left the school. Brian continued, The first thing that seemed strange, I remember quite distinctly, was that I asked Maxine if at school they'd done strange danger and don't get into cars. Mm. I asked her from her knowledge of Holly and Jessica how she thought they might have reacted if, for example, a man had pulled up alongside in a car and said, would you like a lift, girls? But before Maxine could answer the question, Ian answered for her, quote, Holly would probably get in the car and quietly go, but Jessica wouldn't. She'd put up a real fight and a real struggle, end quote. A bit of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Yeah. Obviously, Brian was like, how <clears throat> how the hell do you know how Holly and Jessica would, would react to this mm. very specific situation? Yeah, right. Very it's... strange and creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Considering, in theory, he wouldn't have had much or shouldn't shouldn't be having much interaction with the students, considering he's a caretaker. Uh, exactly. And, and he wasn't the caretaker of their school. Oh, right. Oh, blimey. He's, right. He's okay. at the college, which yeah. is for older oh, kids. Right. They're Fair. at primary school. So right. he doesn't know the girls. No. It's only um, his partner that knows the girls. I see. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Well, that's even weirder that he's answered that question then, isn't it? Yeah. Even stranger. Brian started digging a bit deeper into this interaction with the girls and he gave out more information than he did to the police. Ian has said that he and Maxine had been out with their dog, but the dog got muddy and wet. So Ian was washing his dog outside the house and Maxine had gone upstairs to have a bath when he saw the two girls come past his home. Ian explained how they asked how Miss Carr was doing as they knew she had left the school and was looking for a new job. But that was it. Ian insisted they didn't say anything else and Brian left. But that was it. Ian insisted that they didn't say any, anything else. And then Brian left with a suspicious feeling in his gut. He reported his conversation to the police, just to be on the safe side. He thought it was just a bit odd, but nothing came of it. Hmm. Later that same day, Ian gave an interview with the BBC, where he openly admits he is probably the last person to see the girls before they disappeared. Hmm. which in a lot of cases can make you the prime suspect well, of an it, investigation. It probably should make you the prime suspect. But again, nothing was really followed up. Hmm. Following the sighting they had from Ian Webster of the green car heading to Newmarket on the night of the girl's disappearance, on the 13th of August, a jogger phoned the police at around 7pm. He had found two mounds of disturbed earth in Newmarket, just 10 miles from Soham. The man said he had also heard screams of people there on the night of the girls' disappearance. Could this be the two girls everyone has been desperate to find alive? Police begin a search of the area, which goes on through the night. Both families were taken to the site and were told to expect the worst, which I can't even imagine how they were feeling. Everyone in Soham held their breath that night. And at 4am the next morning, police confirm that the areas of disturbed earth was not anything suspicious and are probably just badger sets. Okay. Which are just their, like, dens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The families of the girls talk of a little hope 
after their longest night. So, uh, what the taxi driver said, it didn't come to anything, basically. Right. What, that the, 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 he saw the two children in the car and stuff? Well, just kind of like the new market side of Oh, things. right, okay. Like location-wise and mm-hmm. stuff? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ten days into the investigation, police were still nowhere near finding Holly and Jessica. The public and the media started to turn on them put pressure on them and doubt whether they were really doing enough. So in an unusual turn of events, the police decided to host a televised appeal to the girls to get them home. David Beck, the acting detective superintendent of Cambridgeshire Police, led the appeal and spoke directly to the camera in front of all the journalists speaking directly to the abductors and the girls. Trying to reason with the abductor, persuading them that they do have a way out of this. David explains he has left a private voicemail and left messages on Jessica's phone. So I'm assuming she had disappeared um, with the phone. They haven't found the phone. Hmm. He encourages the abductor to listen to the messages. It will tell him or her how to contact David in order to end this horrible situation. This was a smart move by the police as they had a hidden agenda to this appeal. They were hoping to trick the perpetrator into turning on Jessica's phone to hear the messages so the police could then track the phone directly to yeah. them. It's pretty smart. Pretty smart for 2002. As well, I thought yeah. that was pretty smart. A bit deceptive, but yeah. you've got to be deceptive when you're trying to catch Absolutely. Like gross human beings. Absolutely. However, this wasn't enough to encourage the public that they were doing enough. And on the 15th of August, with Holly and Jessica still missing, they review the investigation and have a change of leadership. Detective Chief Superintendent Christopher Stevenson looked over the investigation around 11 days after the girls went missing. To gain a fresh perspective, he started from the beginning, looking over everything to see if there was a new direction he could look into. He came across... Um, a note about the caretaker of the school, Ian Huntley, being the last person to see the girls alive and noticed that they hadn't looked into this properly. Christopher knew to begin here, focusing on Ian Huntley. Surprisingly, this was the the first he'd really been looked into, considering he was probably the last person to see the two girls. Mm. It's just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And the fact that the, the journalist, you know, gave him a bit of a heads up on him as well. Exactly. It seems crazy that they didn't do, if uh, if yeah. they didn't do reasonable police work to at least rule him out, seems unreasonable. Yeah, exactly. And that's not the only time he's mentioned as well. So we'll get to that. Mm. They started looking into his movements from the Sunday, the 4th of August, when the girls disappeared and noticed how, since then, he was very involved in the investigation. He was always around and giving multiple interviews to journalists, attending all the vigils and meetings and searches, always inserting himself into whatever was happening, which did seem odd to the police. Of course, the whole town was in some way involved, Mm. you know, in the searches, etc. But Ian just seemed extra involved, always wanted to be... In front of the camera, talking. um, Like eager to be there, almost. Yeah, yeah, you know. And and he was, you know, being very nice, wanting to help. It's not like he was taking the shine away from anything. He Mm. was just, you know, being very nice and just wanting to help. Mm. But it wasn't just the police that took an interest in Ian. The journalists did too. Jeremy Thompson, a reporter for Sky News, did an interview with Ian Huntley on the 15th of August outside of his home. So I've got a clip that we can play. Okay. How do we know they were here at 6.15? Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. You're the school caretaker. The girls, Jessica and Holly, would know you. And they saw you on the front doorstep. What, what went on? The girl, I don't know the girls. Um, I stood on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. 
um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was. And she used to teach them at St Andrews. You know, I just said she weren't very good and she hadn't got the job. And they just said, please tell her that we're very sorry. And uh, off they walked in the direction of the, um, the library over there. So he explains how he doesn't personally know the girls, uh, which he wouldn't do as he's not the caretaker of the school, mm. like I said. But as we know, they knew Maxine Carr as their teaching assistant. So that's the connection there. Is that, sorry, just to clarify, is Maxine Carr his wife or his girlfriend just or something? A girlfriend. They live right. together. Yeah, partner. partner. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But he generally explains everything how he explained it to the previous journalist, Brian Farmer. Jeremy continued down the street into the centre of Soham, where he began interviewing Maxine Carr. Tell us a bit about them. Lovely, really bubbly girls. Um, they're ever so funny. They're brilliant. They're kind to everybody. Um, they won't say a bad word about anybody. And they love their families and everything, which is why nobody believes that they would ever run away. Um, they was very close to all their family. Tell us something about this card you're holding. Uh, this is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. Um, it's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She was very, very upset because I didn't get my job. And um, she just gave me this with a poem on the inside saying um, to a special teaching assistant, really. And we'll, we'll miss her a lot and we'll see her in the future. And that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely. Really lovely. That's really very sweet, isn't it? Any thoughts tonight? I mean, 11 days is a long time. I mean, if you, if they could see you now, what would uh, Maxine Carr say to Holly and Jessica? Just get on the phone and, and just come home. Just come home. Or if somebody's got them, just, just let them go. It doesn't matter where you let them go, as long as you just let them go and let them come home. Um, yeah, so I was Maxine Carr, and she obviously had uh, nothing but nice words mm. to say about the two girls. Mm. Um, but what a lot of people have taken from this clip, I don't know if you noticed it, obviously it's your first time watching it, um, was that she spoke about them in the past tense. Right. So she would say things, she said like, that's the kind of girl she was. Right. She said a lot of past tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things. And obviously that doesn't, that in the past that has been a thing with uh, people that have died then been talked about in past tense blah 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 but I'm not sure if it means so much to me because he asked the question in past tense oh right okay I mean I don't think he it... says what were they like so it's yeah. more like, oh they were like this this is what they were. I don't know yeah, so well, it doesn't get is, so I... much weight for me but no, people sure. really have kind of honed in on that I don't think it's too much to hone in on because because she knows them in terms of a past tense as well, doesn't exactly. she? Exactly. Her experience with them at was... At school, in the past. At, in the past, yeah. Yeah. And also That's there's... I feel. Yeah, and also there's a little bit of, uh, like, judgment that they... Well, not judgment, that's not the right word, but opinions going around that they might not be alive anymore. At this yeah. point. Like a little bit. Like it's, it's questionable. Well, I think it's more that they're abducted. I think that's more the focus yeah, right now. Yeah, okay. But yeah, I think you're right with them. She was their teacher. She's not anymore. So that's something that happened in the past. Yeah, so it's just... It doesn't mean that much to me. But she brings up the card again. You know, she doesn't mm. get emotional at all. But, you know... Mm. Maybe a tiny bit, but not, obvi- not obviously no. emotional. No. But yeah, nothing but good things to say about the girls. Mm. Another avenue police wanted to look into further was Jessica's mobile phone that they knew she had on her when she disappeared. They brought in technology experts and they looked through her phone logs and saw her phone was switched off exactly 6.46pm. On the day they went missing. On the day they went missing. And from the CCTV timestamp, it was around 20 minutes since they were last seen on the CCTV. So on the CCTV it said 6... I think it says 6.22 or something, or 6.24... And then 20 minutes later, the phone was switched off. Mm. So there's a kind of 20 minute kind of window there. What was significant about this is because when a phone is turned off, it sends a signal to its closest phone tower. In Soham, they have 
a tower near the football club, but there are very f there are very few areas around Soham that connect to a different phone tower, which is in Burwell, which is another town about ten minutes down the road. And Jessica's phone, when it was turned off, connected to the phone tower in Burwell. Okay. So that's why it's significant. Yeah. David Bristow was a forensic telecommunications engineer that was brought in to try and explain why Jessica's phone connected to the Burwell Tower. At that time, in 2002, he used his Nokia 3310, throwback, mm. mobile phone that would tell him which particular cell was serving him. Okay. Yeah. Basically, what he did was he figured out where a mobile telephone could have been switched off by using signal data from surrounding transmission masts. He came up with three areas. He started at Holly's house, went up to Soham Village College, up into town, then the high street and back round to Holly's house. So he did a loop round mm -hmm. doing this thing on his phone. Yeah. I didn't really understand it, I'm not going to lie, but... But it, it just allowed him to define him. which cell tower... The phone was pinging from. As they went around on a route that they believed yeah. the girls yes. could have gone on. Uh -huh. So he was just doing this thing on his phone and, and trying to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I guess trying to match the cell tower in Burwell. Yeah. Trying to find out where on that route it exactly. pinged Burwell. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. But only one appeared to have any relevance as it was the only one that coincided with the route the CCTV cameras and evidence from a number of witnesses had shown Holly and Jessica took. And the the only one area yeah. that coincided was outside of an address. Okay. Five college close. Okay. Police officers were astounded by this revelation. That was Ian Huntley's house. Yeah, right. Of course. But was it just a coincidence? They still didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. He had no previous convictions or allegations made against him. They made checks in Humberside, where Ian was from, but nothing came out of it. But I assume at this point he must be suspect number one. He has to be. I mean, they didn't really uh, make that public. No, sure, fine. But Maybe he must not, have been. But he must have he been. He must have been. Can't not have been. If he wasn't, that would be a real failure. Well, I think now that they've got the new leadership, yeah, I think he's, he's better than the ones before. I think they were floundering a bit. On Friday the 16th of August, Hollywell's parents and Jessica Chapman's parents make their first joint appeal since the beginning of the investigation, asking for their girls to come home, how much they miss them and want to see them. They thank the police and the public for all their help and support. Yet, a couple of hours later, another press conference was held. DCI Andy Hebb announces that a 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman, both from the Soham area, are being spoken to by police officers and have agreed to give witness statements and help police with their inquiries. Andy went on to say how they are now going to thoroughly inspect their house for any evidence that might help with their investigation of the two missing girls. Police didn't name the two people, but a few journalists had an inkling of who it might be. It suddenly clicked for it suddenly clicked for them. The two people were Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr. Mm. Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr were both interviewed outside of Soham in different locations, and they both stuck to the same stories that they had told previously. Ian was washing his dog outside when he saw the girls, Maxine was inside having a bath. They could both verify each other's stories about how the girls left and went off towards the library, alive and well. Just to bear in mind here, Ian and Maxine weren't arrested mm, or charged no. with anything. They were there to help with their inquiries so they could share their knowledge on what had gone on. Ian was interviewed by a female police officer. And in the clip, he appears... I can't show the clip again. He appears quite open, he's kind of very relaxed, his body language is like his legs are open, his arms are kind of just chilling, and he's answering all of uh, their questions in a lot of detail. 
But as he's asked more questions, he starts feeling the pressure and starts to change his demeanour when asked about Holly. He's describing what Holly looks like. He says, she's blonde, shoulder length hair, very slim. In fact, I'd say thin. But then goes silent for a full minute. Okay. The interviewer purposefully doesn't interject or start talking to fill the space. They just sit there in silence. He puts his head in his hands, looking like he's kind of racking his brain, trying to figure out like what to say next and what's happening. And after a minute, he just says he doesn't know what else to say. And that's it. Okay. So quite strange behaviour. Hmm. 30 miles away, Maxine Carr is having her interview. At 4.30pm on the 16th of August, Maxine is relaying the the 4th of August to the interviewer. She seems pretty happy and smiley, without a care in the world, really. She even jokes around saying she's asked him so many questions about that day on the 4th of August, seeing the girls. As in she's asked She's asked him about it. Yeah, she's yeah. asked Ian about it so many times. Like, are you sure? Yeah. You know, that they went? Are you sure anything else didn't happen? And yeah, and then she joked saying, she's asked him so many questions about that day. She's made him feel like a suspect. Right. Which is a bit of a weird thing to say, really. Yeah, I guess. I think. It's a bit She's made strange. him feel like a suspect. I think that's yeah. very odd. Well, it just means that she was, must have been really going at him, asking him questions kind of thing. I know, but that's just a weird thing to say, I think. Because mm, mm. it's like, why would you feel like you'd need to do that? Yeah, well, yes. That's I mean, odd. firstly, yeah. That's yeah, kind of what absolutely. I asked. It's like, well, why would you, why well, would I, you not trust her, yeah. what he's saying straight yeah, away? Right, like, if right. you said that to me, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be like, are you sure? Well, yeah, no, sure? unless I was like acting weird or something about it. But he's probably turned around and said, ah, oh, he's making me feel like a suspect. I wonder yes. if that happened. Hey, hey. But she re- reiterates her story, adds they had a roast dinner and goes into detail about that, but nothing out of the ordinary. Whilst these interviews are going ahead, police start searching Ian and Maxine's home. And as neither of them were under arrest, they were released that evening and taken to a hotel to stay in together. However, things were about to unravel for the couple. Jerry Lawton, chief crime correspondent at the Daily Star, received a phone call from a woman who had seen on the news what had been going on. She insisted that on the night of her birthday, she was with her friends at the pub and Maxine Carr gate crashed her party. Her party was on the 4th of August, Hmm. 100 miles away in Grimsby. She even had photo evidence from the night. It was her birthday, so they took lots of photos, not realising what they had actually captured. So she sent them the photos on a CD, and there she was, in a group shot. So how could she be in the bath at around 7pm and having a roast dinner, but also two and a half hours away in Grimsby in the same evening? Well, she can't, can she? And if she did do this, why hasn't she mentioned it? Absolutely. Well, Very suspicious. Yeah. Well, incredibly suspicious. Why is she... Why... Yeah. Well, that's the most suspicious thing yet, isn't it? Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He knew he had to inform the police straight away. This completely destroys Ian's alibi as mm. well. There was nobody there to corroborate the fact that he briefly spoke to the girls and they walked off away from the house. And it gives him opportunity because his house is empty. Exactly. Whilst Ian and Maxine are holed up in a hotel, miles away from home, on the 16th of August, police are able to carry on their search and find some chilling evidence. In their house? In Ian and Maxine's house? I will get onto that momentarily. Okay. The next sentence. (laughs) Do you remember the beginning of the case when I mentioned... uh, the caretaker, Ian Huntley, Mm -hmm. showed police officers and dogs around the college grounds and there was one hangar building that they couldn't get in. Yeah. Well, they finally had access to this space and they found in the bottom of a bin two burnt 
red Manchester United shirts. They were burnt, but not very well burnt. Yeah. You could easily still make out what they were. Okay. This was their first real breakthrough with evidence, but the team knew something terrible must have happened Mm -hmm. to Holly and Jessica. On the 17th of August at 8 a.m., Detective Chief Inspector Andy Hebb made a statement to the press. A 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman have been arrested on suspicion of murder. This was the first mention of the girls, sadly, being dead. (coughs) And this investigation had now turned into a double murder investigation. But where were the bodies of these two young girls? And I'd just like to clarify, because I don't think I have yet, that Ian Huntley's home is Mm. um, next door to the college. It is metres away from the hangar. Right, yeah. Because obviously he's the caretaker. Yeah. So just to make that clear, he... He is next door to that space, basically. Yeah. Search tactics now change to start looking for two bodies. Instead of looking for places where they may be taking shelter, they now had to be looking into dark, secret and unknown places. Places people wouldn't necessarily go. And after what felt like forever, but really it was only a few hours... At 1pm on the 17th of August, two bodies were found by three people walking in a wooded area called Thetford Forest Park near the village of Mildenhall and RAF Lankenheath, or Lakenheath, in Suffolk, about 10 miles away from Soham. The area the bodies were found was thick with fir trees and surrounded by farmland and wetland, so somewhat in the middle of nowhere. Police didn't confirm who the bodies were, but this, of course, sent shockwaves through Soham. I didn't realise that it, that they were found that... I'm not that, that, that That's amazingly quickly, but I didn't realise it was only, what, two or three weeks after they'd gone missing. Two weeks two weeks that they were actually found yeah really really I don't know why. all of this has happened within yeah. two weeks in my mind that felt like when i was a kid i guess because mm. it was Forever. all it was all over the news yeah it felt like I, if you asked me to say how long were the ian if you said to me the ian huntley case you know how long do you think those girls were missing for i probably would have said a couple of months mm. at the very least but we were 10 but we were 10 yes so obviously yeah and it was 20 years ago I think that just shows as well how much um, it was all over the media as yeah, well. That true. it just felt like, so much. Like the journalists yeah. themselves, like they said that it felt like they had been there a month, not yeah, two weeks. Right, right. Special Constable Sharon Gilbert from Hampshire came to Soham and had spoken to Ian Huntley during the initial search and she also reported her suspicions. Mm. She had called the inquiry line to the police after an encounter she had with Ian on Wednesday the 7th of August. When she had seen that Ian Huntley had been arrested, she rang the inquiry line again and told them to listen to a previous phone call. And they did and sent over, the, sent over police officers to take a statement from her. Two officers arrive and she relays her statement, quote, Quite early in the conversation, he said to me, how long does DNA evidence last? I said, indefinitely. They've used it on the Russian Tsar family and woolly mammoths, I believe. (laughs) Everything about him made me feel uneasy. He had very strange eyes, like he's looking at you, but through you, like you're not there. At one point, he said the school was locked up. He'd locked it, but he wasn't sure if it would stay locked because the previous caretaker had left in dubious circumstances and had a second set of keys, and it was a possibility he'd been in and out. But before he said he, before he said that, he told everyone, if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. Okay. End quote. So, mm. basically, he's 
he's mentioned this other caretaker that was before him. Yeah. Being a caretaker. And that he's got a second set of keys to the college. Yeah. Basically saying he has access to this space. As well as me. As well as him. Yeah. So is he kind of trying to control the narrative here and say, this? you should be looking at this person. Well, he's at least laying the groundwork for That's that. It. Yes, I would say. Or is he just trying to send the police on the wild goose chase? Well, at that point, though, they weren't particularly suspicious of the college being somewhere where they might be. Aside no. from whether that, that they could have gone and hid there or whatever, yeah. No, but if Ian did this, he knew what yeah. was at the college. Yeah. So he was, like you said, laying the groundwork, mm. putting out the little, the feelers the out seeds, there. Yeah. Yeah, laying the seeds of, oh, there's this other caretaker that's also got keys. Mm. Maybe he's got something to do with that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Cool. Very interesting. But like I said, she um, reported this on the same day that happened, on the 7th on the of 7th. August. Yeah. But nothing came of it until she saw um, that he'd been arrested. And she was just like, what did I tell well, you? I better yeah. tell them again. I don't understand how these things get missed like that. Well, I think... Um, or I like, think they were overrun. They didn't have the manpower and the um, facilities. I'm not de- defending them, but I don't. Mm. They they didn't do a lot of things right, and I think that's probably why. Because they had and they were so, so many focused things on some in. things, but not other things. And I just think they just didn't do a good job. We've been mentioning Ian Huntley a lot, but who is this guy? And who is Maxine Carr? Ian grew up in. Imming, Immingham Grimsby. He was bullied a lot in school, called names, etc. It became so difficult for him that he had to move schools, but he was still bullied when he moved. Older boys would pick on him and he would then take it out on the younger boys. He looked up to his father a lot, but one day caught him having sex with another woman that wasn't his mum. And his father apparently turned on him and beat him. And their relationship was in tatters after that. Experts described how this combined sexual feelings with violence within Ian. He had dreams of becoming an RAF officer, but didn't have the intelligence or the drive to get anywhere with it. In fact, he had very menial jobs and would spend time with young girls on nights out and would lie and pretend he was an RAF officer to impress them. He even went a step further and would sometimes follow girls home. A bit stalkery. I wonder, how do we know this? Um, because, I suppose this all comes out after the fact, doesn't it, as well? But Well, because they were investigating Ian Huntley, so when you investigate someone, mm. you have to find out every scrap yeah. of detail about their life. So they would have sent officers to his hometown and interviewed people. and About him. And right. obviously he's spoken to any police officers over there, got any information from them, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, they would yeah, have, fair. you know, done the work. Uh, Ian came to the attention of police and social workers five times um, in his past. Once after he was accused of having sex with a 15-year-old girl in 1995 when he was 21 but no action was taken another was in 1996 when he was accused of having sex with a 13 year old girl but again nothing happened he moved around a lot and didn't have a lot of friends or strong relationships and in 1995 Ian was 21 years old when he married an 18 year old girl named Claire Evans. They had a whirlwind romance after a few days she had moved in with him and after a month he had proposed. He was described as bubbly, romantic and polite at the start of the relationship but that soon changed once he had full control over her after the wedding. He sexually assaulted her, attacked her in the shower and hacked off her hair so that no other man would find her attractive. Yeah, horrific. And on one occasion, he nearly strangled her to death. So, obviously, a horrible, horrible person. 
She was even forced to abort their baby after Ian allegedly threatened. Have that child and I'll do things to it. Christ. Yeah. So she she did abort the baby and I imagine hindsight, she's probably, probably glad that she did. Yeah. Uh, the marriage ended in 1999. He began to get a reputation as somebody you would not want around young girls or women in your life, which is one of the reasons it is suspected that he was always moving around. He would prey on vulnerable young women and people were starting to catch on. More serious allegations started to come to the surface, allegations of underage sex and also rape. He faced three allegations of rape and one of indecent assault, but none of them resulted in him being found guilty. And it just makes you think, how did this man get a job at a college where he is surrounded by young women? It's disgusting. Mm. In 1998, a young woman said that she had been the victim of a serious indecent assault by a man called Ian 10 months earlier when she was just 11 years old Ian denied this and the case was dropped but despite these allegations he continued to go to clubs and bars and talk to young women and in February 1999 he met Maxine Carr she was 22 and Ian was 25 they began dating and she eventually moved in with him she was quite vulnerable and young and Ian was charming quiet but made her feel as if he would protect her Their relationship was described as getting very intense very quickly. But Maxine loved Ian and was completely devoted to him, even though, let's say, he wasn't the nicest of boyfriends at times. Old neighbours of the couple from when they lived in Grimsby spoke to journalists about how they would often see her in tears and how he controlled her, deciding what they did, who she met and what she can and can't do. They were described as consumed by each other isolating each other from everyone they became very dependent on each other and were described as loners one couldn't breathe without the other so i don't know if you caught on how um i'm talking about allegations and stuff like that but previously i'd said that they looked into his past the police looked into his past and there was no charges or allegations made against Mm. him so I haven't really brought this in to the story, but basically, just from like my memory, there was like almost a bit of a scandal with this because um, I can't remember it exactly, but uh, the police department in Grimsby, whoever they are, they had or they had like a policy where they delete allegations after like a month oh. of them being in the system. Okay. Something like that. So he was basically expunged of all allegations. Right, right. That's so weird. that's why when they asked, yeah, they're like, no, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Even though at that time he was very well known by police, right. But um, on the computer, it wouldn't say anything. It wouldn't say he he was known by them at all. No. Hmm. Mm. So and also how he got a job at That's the college shocking is because um he would use his mother's maiden name right not his real surname obviously yeah. apparently he would i think he used nixon right and back then yeah um schools weren't so hot on checking people out and if right. they did nothing would come up because firstly his his you okay i just pinned my nose Oh, yeah, there's a dot on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, nothing would come up because his file's been deleted yeah. of any wrongdoings. Yeah. Um, and because they, he didn't have the, he didn't put down the right name anyway. No. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Because if you're accused of something and then, or, you know, you've, an allegation's been made against you and, for all intents and purposes, it's it's proved like wrong, right? Like the what allegation, you mean proved wrong? like the allegation that you're is, innocent. Yeah, effectively. Um, should it be deleted or not? 
I mean, no. arguably, no. I think it should still kind of be... I, I think it should still kind especially of be Especially when there. it comes to sexual allegations. Well, because yeah. Because they're hard to prove. Especially, yeah, absolutely. So if you keep getting allegations against you, there's a pattern there. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And if, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Maxine's parents split up when she was younger. She stayed with her mum but didn't see her father again and had no father figure um, in her life growing up. Old friends of Maxine said she was a lost girl during this time, unusual, isolated. She dressed differently to other girls and she also had an eating disorder. She was mostly shy and introverted, but once she had a drink, she would become extremely extroverted. Jason Wink... Maxine's ex-boyfriend said this about her, quote, I mean, there was that many lies she used to tell. She lied about her age when we all knew her. She put four years on her age to what she was. So you can never take what Maxine says as the truth all the time, end quote. Um, Maxine really wanted to become a teacher. So that's when she and Ian moved to Soham in 2001. Fortunately, Holly and Jessica's parents and the town of Soham didn't have to wait long for the results to come back of who the two bodies were that were found the previous afternoon. And unfortunately, on the 18th of August, it was confirmed that the two bodies were the 10-year-old missing girls. Everybody was absolutely devastated. This was not the result that they had imagined would happen. Everyone desperately wanted the girls to come home. Of course. So now the bodies of the poor girls have been discovered. The real work begins. They have who they suspected has murdered them in custody, but they have 72 hours to charge them with the murders. Otherwise, they will have to let them go. Therefore, they must now forensically examine the bodies for any DNA or evidence and, of course, cause of death, and also examine where the bodies were found to look for the same thing. However... With the scene being outside, this would have ruined a lot of evidence that might have been left. Because obviously, were the girls killed there too? Mm. You know, that's just everything that they need to figure out. Professor Patricia Wiltshire is a botanist, a palynologist, and an ecologist. And she was asked to work on this case looking at trace evidence. As soon as the girls were found, the police were on the phone straight away to her and she got there as soon as she could. Quote, it was very important to find the approach path because they wanted to do their fingertip searching. So I found the path for them and as I went into it, I looked up and there was a hair stuck on a twig. It was Jessica's hair. Chances are she was carried in and her hair caught on the twig. And so that proved it was the approach path. Mm. So do you know what I mean by the approach path? Mm, well, the way that the, the way that they went to in. the bodies, where the bodies were found. It's the way that the person with the body, yeah, the girls, would've... walked in. Yeah. yeah. To and then left them and then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the way that they walked in the entrance. Mm-hmm. This is significant as it shows Jessica was carried to this spot, so she was either unconscious or maybe she had been killed elsewhere and her lifeless body was being carried. Professor Wiltshire continues, quote, where the girls were laid was a drainage ditch, and the nettles were up to here, points to a chest, and you could see that someone had gone in, and you could see the depressions their feet had made. They had trampled the vegetation leading down into the ditch. Now, if you tread on a stinging nettle, bending it down, they send... They send shoots out that will start to grow. So basically, it's bent like that. Mm-hmm. Say, shoots there, yeah. where it's bent will start yeah. growing up towards the light. Okay. They have to have a certain amount of time before they can do that. So I looked at those nettles, and I was convinced it was about two weeks. It showed, therefore, the girls hadn't been put somewhere else before they were put in the ditch. They had been there about a fortnight. Mm. So from what Professor Wiltshire has explained, the girls had been there the whole time. While everyone, whilst everyone was desperately, frantically searching for them, countless interviews and appeals being made, sleepless nights and tears, they had already been killed and left in this ditch. 
Professor Wiltshire describes the site that the girls were found. The vegetation was burned and someone had clearly tried to burn the bodies, which is why mm. the shirts were burned also. The red shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were b- being burned where? In the ditch. There was burnt vegetation. Around the bodies. Yeah, and the bodies. But the shirts were in a bin or something. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, they could have. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. One of the first bits of evidence Professor Wiltshire was given to examine was the two Manchester United shirts that were found within the college premises. Premises. Mm. Yeah, premises. that was exactly what I was about to ask. They were also burnt, like I said earlier, um, but there was plenty of plant material there and it was mostly a type of tree called alder, which just so happened to be the trees that were surrounding Holly and Jessica's bodies. This placed the shirts in the ditch at one point, but were removed and taken to the college, linking the two places together. Hmm, it's just a bit gross. It's horrific. Yeah. I just, I just don't know why... Why he would remove the shirts. Yeah. I'm not sure, because he obviously tried to dispose of the bodies using the fire. Yeah. But that didn't work. But it... it, it, We don't know the state of the bodies. That's never been disclosed. So we don't know how damaged their bodies were. Right, right. But, but I just don't know why. The shirts but they were that, but, burnt. Yeah. But you could clearly tell what they were. So... But the thing is, they were burnt, right? They're burnt. I think That's maybe because maybe they were red. He thought that was... Maybe he, visible. Maybe, yeah, maybe like, someone would like, see the red. Yeah. Whereas... But he must have... They, so, but it, he must have tried to burn the bodies then. Yeah. And then go back in after they've... After whatever, after they've been burning, and then take the shirts away. Yeah, possibly. I guess. I mean, I can't... I don't... Or we don't know how big uh, the fire... Like, we don't really know no. the, the size of the but fire. But I, I would assume if the shirt survived... Because, I mean, if they're football shirts, they'll be made out of quite synthetic material that would literally go up, yeah, given the chance. But the shirts would go up, given a, given a good chance of fire. So they must have been quite damp and wet, which would make sense if it's in a drainage ditch and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the guy's a fucking idiot if he's trying to burn them in a, in a drainage <laughs> ditch. But... And then that's... That's what was left of them. I don't know if that's both shirts yeah, or, or, just or one what, but over, like, but... yeah, that's... So they're quite intact, aren't they're very they? intact. I mean... So whether maybe he yeah. removed them before and one and it got... It was on the ground and it got a little mm. bit burned. We don't know that. No, we don't know. Sure, sure, sure. But I know exactly what you're saying. The material that they're made of... It Should go would up. like just like melt it would, straight yeah. away. And quickly, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. I know what you're saying. Mm. With mounting evidence against Ian Huntley, he refuses to answer questions to the police officers interrogating him. He appears very different to how he has appeared in all the previous interviews that he loved doing. He asks officers to repeat very simple questions and his leg is furiously shaking. He's talking very subdued and quietly. Officers and journalists instantly considered whether he was faking this mental health episode in order to explain away his culpability in what he had allegedly done. They saw straight through him. This isn't a new technique criminals try and use, but of course they have to do everything by the books. So they paused the interviews and got him medically reviewed at Rampton Hospital. I'm sure he was thinking, great, I've messed up their interviews. Mm. They're going to run out of time. Obviously, they've only got 72 hours. They're going to have to release me. Perfect. Jobs are good in. But whilst he was staying in Rampton Hospital, police drove there and charged him with the murder of Holly and Jessica whilst he was staying there. And by October 2002, Huntley is finally declared fit to stand trial. Maxine Carr was also being interviewed. She's been told that Ian Huntley is the one who murdered Holly and Jessica. Mm. And she breaks down. No, he can't have. She is then presented with evidence. But <laughs> she is <laughs> evidence. She is then presented with evidence such as 
uh, they found his fingerprints on a bag of their clothes. Maxine shouts, no, and sobs uncontrollably. Maxine Carr is charged with perverting the course of justice mm. because she gave a mm. false alibi. Yeah. But the question remained, did she know more about this? Mm. Or was she even involved in the murder? She appeared in court on the 21st of August. Arguably no, because she was in Grimsby, right? If it all happened on that day. Or like within I suppose a maybe, day or two of that day. I suppose with the murder, it's more, is she involved in the clean-up? Yeah, okay, right. I mean, she was definitely... Therefore knowing of the murder. Yeah, well, she was definitely giving the alibi part, so absolutely in that respect. Mm. But anyway, carry on, I'm sure you'll tell me. She appeared in court on the 21st of August. She is still standing by Ian, saying he would never do this, etc. Experts believe she stuck by Ian Huntley because she was still very much under his control. Mm. He had chipped away at her sense of self and her sense of her own identity. Her relationship with Ian was the most important thing to her and she wanted to preserve that, no matter what, which is why she probably lied about where she was that evening. But because she had given Ian Huntley an alibi, she became the most hated woman in Britain by the public. (laughs) She was absolutely hated. Like, if she would walk the streets, people yeah. would have probably killed her. Right. Karim Kalil, I hope I'm saying your name right, the prosecuting barrister, went to a hearing with the results of Ian Huntley's time in Rampton Hospital. He told the judge that, quote, Ian Huntley was found not to be suffering from any mental illness and that his mental state was entirely... Normal. End quote. So basically, he was faking it the whole time in his interviews, Mm -hmm. obviously. What an idiot. Karim knew, based on Ian's previous exchanges with journalists, that they were... that that were well documented during the searches, that the idea of him being unfit for trial was pretty thin. Ian Huntley is told by the judge he will stay in prison until his trial. Therefore, is sent to Woodhill Prison in Milton Keynes. (laughs) Karim was positive they had the right person and now he had to prove it. Quote, this was a case that couldn't be lost. End quote. He knew the amount of emotion the whole nation was feeling and he knew he could not let them down. It was the 30th of August, 2002. The day Holly and Jessica's parents could lay their beloved children to rest, 26 days after they last saw them alive. The memorial service was held in Eli Cathedral with around 2,000 people attending. Kevin Wells wrote a poem and read it out to everyone, which was obviously incredibly moving and heart-wrenching. It was, it made me cry. Hmm. Due to insane amounts of articles and news about the case, the defence argued that the two defendants would not get a fair trial because of all the media coverage. So a high-up judge warned the journalists and basically told them to stop covering the story so much, just to to back off, Mm -hmm. because it was getting out of control. However, the prosecuting team rallied on and began preparing for the trial. Evidence that they were bringing to trial consisted of finding 49 fibres from the football shirts were found around Ian Huntley's house, as well as in the boot of his car. The fibres were found on a pair of curtains that the prosecution hypothesised were used to wrap the children in to then take them away to the ditch. Karim had his theory on what happened that night, but theories were not enough. They had to prove their hypothesis with evidence. They went back to the house that had been very thoroughly cleaned probably after Ian's conversation with Sharon Gilbert about DNA. The prosecution had the house stripped down to below the floorboards to look for any signs of a murder, but initially nothing was coming up. The house was completely stripped bare. Every item from the home was bagged and labelled and stored in a nearby hangar, heavily guarded by police. Every item from the home... Mm. Around 8,000 items were individually bagged in there. It was wild. 
I've never heard of that before. Mm. No, it sounds a bit excessive, but I'm sure. They just... They needed to get something out. They had to get him down. They had to. They enlisted the help from Dr. Andrew Moncrief, a forensic geologist. His job entails the taking or trying to find the geological materials in the possession of a suspect, for example, on shoes or in a car, and then trying to establish whether or not they came from a crime scene. Mm-hmm. He was asked he was asked to come to the dirt track near where the bodies were found. He noticed piles of chalk and builders rubble along the track, but didn't think too much of it. However, when he looked at Ian Huntley's car, he saw quite a lot of material semi-hardened onto the front suspension of the car. That's when he realised how important those random piles were, as the only way this material could have ended up on his car would be from driving the car over these piles on that track. Maxine was held in Holloway Prison in London, and initially she kept in contact with Ian Huntley. She wrote him for hours every single day. And they were very long, essay-length letters too. She was still unaccepting that he was responsible for the murder of the two girls. But four months after going to prison, Maxine starts to distance herself from Ian. She's been out of his control now and has been able to find herself for the first time in years and starts to learn some independence. Her lawyers would remind her um, that it was Ian who committed these crimes, not her. But do not doubt that he won't drag you down with him. So the prosecution so the prosecution believes that's why she ended up changing her story. And in December 2002, she ends her relationship with Ian Huntley. In June 2003, 10 months after he had been arrested, Ian Huntley was found collapsed in his cell from a suspected self-harming incident. He was convulsing and was rushed to Milton Keynes Hospital, where he was already in a coma. This can be a common move with murderers and controlling narcissists, as it is their one last sense of control, taking their own life before trial, meaning nobody has a chance to convict him or go through that process to find out kind of the information. Yeah. He'd already lost control over Maxine Carr, so could this be a last desperate attempt of control? Either way, he survived. It didn't work. He still went to trial. Sucker. Yeah, idiot. In fact, three weeks before the trial, Ian had still not discussed what happened on the 4th of August with anyone. Mm. But during a conference with the prosecution and defence teams before the trial... The defence wanted to make a number of statements to the prosecution. The statements read, quote, Huntley's position as of conference on the 14th of the 10th, 03. There is no dispute about the following. One, girls went to five college close and did not leave alive. Two, girls died in five college close. Three, girls taken in Fiesta Boot to deposition site, which is where they were found. That's what they call it. Mm -hmm. Four, H, Huntley, Mm -hmm. put them into the ditch. Five, H, removed their clothing. Six, H, set them on fire. Seven, H, took clothes back to the hangar and set them on fire. This was hugely significant. Mm, but, yeah, a bit more than... He had yeah. admitted to a lot, finally. Right. Of course, the evidence backed this up anyway. Yeah. So he had no... He obviously could have denied it still, but what's the point? Well. Mm. But now they have almost a confession from him. But if you notice, it doesn't say that he admits to killing them directly. No. He admits to them dying in his house. Right. And that they didn't leave alive. Yeah. But it's very unspecific. Yes, Yet true. specific at the same time. Uh-huh. Finally, on the 5th of November, 2003, the trial begins. 
The families of Holly and Jessica attend the trial. Ian and Maxine arrive at the courthouse separately, but were seated metres away from each other, as were the two families of the girls, all within metres of each other. I can't even imagine being in a room with my own child's murderer. Mm-hmm. These parents are just so strong for yeah. doing this. Yeah, any. You wouldn't be um, forgiven for wanting to strangle him, would you? No. Journalists were called in as witnesses as they originally spoke with Ian Huntley. Forensic experts were also called to the witness box. They talked about his Fiesta car, how he tried to clean it, as he was obviously aware of trace evidence. Mm -hmm. But he still didn't do it well enough. Scissors were found in the boot of his car that had fibres of the football shirt on them. So obviously where he might have maybe cut, yeah. cut the shirt off. Yeah. They also noticed changes to his car. And because he was... They also noticed changes to his car. Because he was so well documented by journalists immediately when the girls had gone missing, they had footage of his car mm-hmm. from then. And obviously, um, when he was arrested, they noticed that he had changed his tyres. Right. It turns out he changed his tyres the day after the girls went missing. Which is pretty clever, as it would obviously get rid of any of the mud residue yeah. that experts would pick up on. And also tyre tracks might not be the same. No. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately for him though, that wasn't enough. There was plenty of soil and mud caught up in the mud flaps of the car, which was tested by Professor Wiltshire, as well as the foot pedals. They were all very similar, and they were all very similar to the palynological profile at the crime scene. Panological is the study of plant pollen spores and certain microscopic plankton Mm. organisms, just in case anyone Mm. was wondering. Very interesting. Yeah. So the prosecution was able to put Ian Huntley in his car and on that road without a doubt. Yeah. As Ian had been denying that this whole time, so this proves that he has lied and he was there. Mm. Yeah. On the 10th of November 2003, the judge, jury, the prosecution and defence counsel were all taken to Soham to key locations within the case. They closed off the whole town. Nobody was allowed to go outside. Shops were closed. Schools were closed. Nobody was allowed outside. It's quite something, isn't it? I, it's so interesting to me. But, yeah, apparently it was eerie yeah, I walking bet. around there. Weird. Yeah, crazy. So they can get a real feel for what this case is all about. <clears throat> They were allowed access to Ian's house, which had been torn apart. Um, They were taken to the hangar where the girl's clothing was found, burnt, um, and only metres away from Ian's house. They could really see that perspective. Ian was saying how he had just found the clothes. That's why his fingerprints are there. Mm. But the prosecution quickly denied these claims as his fingerprints were found inside the bag that the clothes were wrapped inside of, as well as on the outside of the bag. They were then taken to the dirt track where Ian allegedly drove down with the girls in his car and then ended with the site where the bodies were found and burnt. It was described as a very moving and solemn day, especially when they were at the grave site. Mm. On the 13th of November, Ian Huntley takes the stand and then trigger warning because we he's going to start talking about the events of right the four so skip ahead like a minute into this if you don't want to hear that because it's about young children um he claims the girls died at his house by accident one of the girls had a nosebleed so he took them to his bathroom to clean her up holly fell into the bath that was filled with water and Jessica started screaming. He tried to cover up her screams and accidentally killed Jessica by smothering her to get her to stop. And then Holly accidentally drowned in the bath. 
He didn't mean for them to die. Okay. That's all he said, really. But this story is ridiculous, obviously. Mm. This seems so awful and like ridiculous to say, but to kill one person, I guess that could be like considered more so an accident, but to then have a second mm. die. Yeah. Especially when the second one is just in a bath. You could just mm. lift them out of the bath. Well, surely. Well, yeah. I mean, they could lift themselves out of the bath, you'd think. That's what was... As well. None of it really made sense. No, it doesn't. It's a bit. That's an obscure story. You know, if he's saying Holly accidentally drowned, he didn't want her to die, then why didn't he just immediately get her out of the bath? Mm. You know, if a, if a child, like, accidentally falls into, um, like, a bath, like, their face goes mm. in the water, or, like, they're in a swimming pool and mm-hmm. they go under, mm-hmm. your kind of, like, jerk reaction is to lift their head, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Like, just, you're like, oh, yeah, God, yeah. oh. Yeah. And, I mean, as well, I mean, if he's smothering um, the other girl, I can't... Jessica. Jessica. Uh, I mean, like... I don't know. It's, it, you're smothering someone until they're dead. I mean, that's that's got to be, that's got to take some time. Yeah, and they also, showed like, that in court. The prosecution yeah. said it would have taken minutes. Yeah, right. For that to to happen. So if you're accidentally doing it, mm. would you not think, oh, I shouldn't be doing this? Yeah, you know, and if that it was an accident. Well, absolutely. And that person would have stopped screaming at some point, right? Yeah, but they, before. Yeah, but they were dead. Yeah, but they then would have been alive to then tell what happened. That yeah. he tried to strangle her. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, yeah. Well, you know, And obviously yeah. that couldn't, that no, couldn't that, happen. No, no, right. The prosecution, uh, Mr. Latham, started on their hypothesis as to why they think he lured the girls in his house. And based on his past behaviour with young girls, they persisted heavily that there was a sexual motive behind luring the girls back into his house, mm. which would make sense. Well, mm, according to his allegations, yeah. This made Ian Huntley crack. He suddenly became enraged, shouting back at the prosecution. I don't know what his words were. Mm. I couldn't find that. But afterwards, after he was shouting back at them, there was just a deafening silence around the court. With the prosecution asking one more question... Did you lose your temper with the girls on that Sunday evening? Mm. <laughs> this showed how he could suddenly change from the calm person he's, he was trying to portray himself as to someone quite aggressive. Mm. Yeah. On the 4th of December 2003, Maxine Carr is cross-examined. Remember, she had completely turned on Ian by this point. She was on the stand and pointed at Ian and said she would not be blamed for what that thing has done. She completely blamed Ian for what had happened. Uh, Mr Hubbard, who is representing Maxine, speaks to the jury. He tries to persuade them that she had nothing to do with this. She had no choice but to go along with what he said, which could be somewhat true, you know, if he was as controlling as... um, (coughs) What she's implied. You know, if he treated his ex-wife the way he did, I wouldn't be surprised if he was the same, if not worse, with Maxine. Yeah, right. On the 12th of December, the jury retires to consider its verdict. After a six-week-long trial, Ian Huntley was found guilty of two counts of murder and is sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 40 years meaning he could be eligible to leave prison in 2042. Mm. So not just actually under 20 that long years. Away. Yeah, 19 years from mm. now. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this or made it clear, but Ian was only 28 or 29 mm. when he yeah. committed these murders. Yeah. He was very young, even though he looked haggard as fuck. <laughs> He'll only be 68 when eligible for parole. Mm. Well, that is quite old. Not really. Not, I mean... He's not on death's door, is he? No, no. I just want that mental. Well, it depends on how... And what is crazy as well, well is... Kept. I can't remember what it's called, but... Basically, they changed a law 
um, which meant that um, under certain circumstances, people could get life without parole. Yeah. And that went into, um, when that became law, Mm -hmm. like a few days after he was sentenced. Oh, blimey. Right, okay. Because in reality, he would have got life without Probably, parole. Yeah, sure. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to get out. No. But let's face it, he's not going to get out, even if he's eligible. He won't ever get out. Well, no way Colin, Colin, what's his name, did? Colin Pitchfork, did? Yeah, but he's back in, isn't he? Yeah. Well, yeah, true. But he's still got, he's still got out for a bit. He was sent to HMP Wakefield. He didn't show any emotion when the verdict was read out. He is still today considered one of the most calculating murderers in the UK. Nobody would have suspected him. If he just kept his big mouth shut, maybe he would have never been caught. But thank God he was. Mm. Or an idiot, honestly. Because that's literally what got him noticed was... Yeah, talking If he had much. never said, oh yeah, I saw the girls. They yeah. Kept- no one else said that they saw no, them right. talking to him. No, no. But so, because yeah. of his ego and he wanted to be like the star of the show almost. I guess, yeah. Or at least I get I, I don't know if I don't know if it's necessarily about him wanting to be the star of the show, potentially. I don't really I don't I don't fully know. You've obviously looked at this more than me. But um is it not maybe more of an attempt to paint yourself as definitely not the perpetrator of the crime because you're going out there saying oh yeah you know i did see them yeah and they went that way so it definitely wasn't me because they went that way like, you know, well no i think hit. it was more like he wanted he wanted to come across really helpful and concerned and mm. you know like yeah he could never do it because he's so yeah. concerned well, that's what i'm saying at the same yeah. time yeah mm. he's come, he's trying to come across like that i yeah. think yeah and i would agree i would agree um yeah Yes, yeah. By putting himself really out there. It's like, yeah, good job, idiot. (laughs) Uh, Maxine was found guilty of perverting the course of justice, but not guilty of assisting an offender. She was sentenced to three and a half years. Blimey. In HMP, Boston Hall, Mm. not a lot amount of time. However, she only served half her time and was released on probation on the 14th of May, 2004. Due to the nation hating this woman, her life was threatened. Therefore, she was given a completely new identity. And she won an injunction in the, on the 24th of February 2005, granting her lifelong anon, anon, anonymity on the grounds that her life would otherwise be in danger. Which is accurate, as women who look, looked like her were attacked. <laughs> Dozen, yeah. there was dozens of cases. Right. She was the most hated woman in Britain. So, what can you expect? Mm. Criminologist Professor David Wilson said, the Sower murders created such an intense feeling of revulsion from the public that anybody who played a part would have difficulty after their release from having any sort of life that could be regarded as normal under their old identity. So I get it, fine, whatever. It, reported, it reportedly cost... Um, the taxpayers millions of pounds to get her a new identity which just added fuel to the fire mm, of course uh, mm, yeah fair. What? that's just crazy isn't it that, that kind of thing cost millions of pounds I mean I know just change you, your passport yeah I was about to say take her to the hairdresser well, get a new haircut what, what well, else well yeah give, probably, you probably <laughs> have to give her a home somewhere else um, you know, give her an opportunity to find work and things like that. I don't know. There's, there's, there's obviously a lot to it, and Just there's get a lot a flat. of. She doesn't need a house. No, well, no, yeah, fine, but there's like somewhere to live. <laughs> but there's a lot of moving parts to that that that. They obviously do cost money, but I just millions just seems crazy to me. But it's anyway. just annoying because it's like, well, does she deserve it? Well, really? um, yeah. I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, she she may. It's like you commit a crime and then you just get given loads of free shit. Well, win. Well, only because her life's in danger. It wouldn't have been if her life wasn't in danger. Yeah, because she did, she did something wrong. Yeah. 
She tried to release an autobiography about her life shortly after release, but it got dropped due to so many complaints. Mm, and obviously, like, it's supposed to be incognito, love. Yeah. That's, that's a bit weird. Yeah. Trying to make money off of it. Gross. Yeah. There's always been a doubt as to how much Maxine Carr really knew about the deaths of the girls as well. She was only in Grimsby for a day or two. In that time, Ian would have killed the girls, disposed of their bodies, and cleaned the house like a madman. Mm. There is no way she came home and didn't smell the cleaning products. I can't imagine he was the kind of guy that would randomly clean the whole house so it was spotless just for no reason. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's fucking suspicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird. Very strange. But whatever. But apparently now she is married with kids somewhere in the UK having a jolly good time. (laughs) And hopefully this is haunting her for the rest of her life in some respect. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what to make of it. Well, well, at the end of the day, though, she she may not have assisted in the crime itself. I think she knew about it. But but she did assist in keeping a... Uh, keeping him safe keeping for a him bit longer. Keeping him safe for longer, yeah. And, well, and seemingly would have done so for even longer. I suppose there is an argument for not, not like battered woman syndrome, but like... That type of thing. Yeah, there's, de- um, yeah, there's definitely like the whole control coercive thing. Coercive behaviour and stuff, you know? Not wanting to go against him. Yeah. It's got I totally get stuff, stuff like that. that. Um, you'll be glad to know Ian Huntley has not had an easy ride in prison. Two years into his sentence at HMP Wakefield in 2005, spree killer Mark Hobson, who you probably don't know of, poured boiling water on Ian horrible yes yes quite horrific Huntley was then transferred to HMP Franklin where a lot of infamous killers live e.g. I don't know if you'll know you might know some of these names Levi Belfield Mm. Wayne Cousins Mm. yeah of course yeah and Peter Sutcliffe yeah I've heard of those two yeah but I I wouldn't I don't know what crime like yeah obviously they're horrible but I don't know what the crimes are in 2010, armed robber Damien Folks slashed Ian's throat, causing him to go to hospital. He didn't die. Mm. In 2006, Ian tried to commit suicide again by overdose. He, like, stored um, some tablets in, like, a CD case or something and then right. just took a bunch of them. Um, he actually confessed to the 1998 rape of the 11 year old girl blimey okay not sure why he did no but he did yeah and like the girl came out as like a grown woman and was just like yeah yeah jeez apparently now he is a shell of a man and we wouldn't recognise him but who cares Mm. he won't ever get out of prison so he can just rot there for all I care yeah Good riddance. And that is the case of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, the sweet, innocent, 10-year-old girls that had their whole lives ahead of them. All they wanted to do was watch football, play on the computer, and hang out with each other and their families. But that was stolen from them in an unimaginable way. The case may be 20 years old now, but it shook the nation to the very core, and I don't think we'll ever get over it. They will always be remembered and their memories live on. Mm. Sadness. Yeah, I said it's a horrific case. I bet a lot of parents uh, <coughs> changed their parenting after oh, yeah. this case. Like, I wonder if our parents did, just not knowing. Maybe, probably did a bit. I mean, it's probably probably more so for yourself, being a girl. Being yes. Um, and, you know. and their age. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We were 10, they were 10. Is it? And they, was it? Yeah, I suppose it was, yeah, 2002. Yeah, we would have been the same age, yeah. That's crazy to think about. Blimey. Right, okay, well, thanks for listening to our 10th episode. Happy Halloween. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a tough episode about kids again. Sorry, the second one in a row. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll see you again soon. And remember to like and subscribe. And yeah, we'll see you in November. For episode 11. Bye.